Welcome. If you're here, that means that you have already watched the uh, H2B Visa 2024-2025 Ultimate Guide video, which is video one of this five-part series. Uh, in this video, I'm going to take you through the prevailing wage. Now, if you want even more information, then below this in a carousel and or on a link in the video description, uh, you can find the written H2B 2024-2025 Ultimate Guide, which goes through this in detail. A lot of people liked our 21-2022 guide, uh, and this is updated with a lot of new information because this process, it's constantly changing. What I want to tell you about now is the prevailing wage, which for my money as an H2B lawyer these past eight years is uh, the most strategic, actually, of, of the filings that you have to make, even though it's in some ways the easiest and the quickest. Okay, so what is the prevailing wage? The prevailing wage is the wage that you are required to pay an HTB worker in an occupation within the area of intended employment that the worker is going to work. There's two really important pieces of um, uh, information within that definition that you have to understand. One is the area of intended employment. The other is occupation in that order. So let's take them both in stride. First, you have the area of intended employment. Now, the area of intended employment, again, simply put, is where your worker is going to be working. And it's based on the county, right? Or, or it's based on the metropolitan uh, uh, area that your worksite is in. Sometimes it can be a non-metropolitan area that your worksite is in. It can also be a metropolitan area that spans two states, so it's not necessarily within a single state. To give you an idea of why this is important, if you don't define your prevailing wage correctly, or if you think that it's the same thing as like a minimum wage, where then you're going to be in for a bad time, okay? You're going to be in for a bad time. Let me give you an example. If you're a small retail business, okay, that has one store within one county, well then easy enough. Your area of intended employment that you should be putting down is going to be uh, that one county that you'll be working in. But let's say you're a landscaping company, okay? You're not just working in one county typically, you're working in a cluster of counties, they all need to be in your application. Let's say you are a franchise owner, okay, um, that is working uh, in, uh, across three different counties, okay? Well, then the question becomes, do you put down all three counties or the metropolitan uh, area that those three counties might all be a part of, you have to check the maps to figure out which one of those is correct. Let's say you're a long haul truck driving business. Well, in that case, you might want to have an itinerary that's going to go through multiple states and you're going to want to have a good idea at least of where your long haul truckers are likely to go because if they go to a county they're not supposed to go to, you can't hire them actually to do work in that county. So this can be as uh, simple of a task or a very complex task depending on your business. The next bit to understand is that uh, you have to pick an occupation that can be defined according to the standard occupational code put out by the Department of Labor. You can't pick a job that can't be defined by the standard occupational code, that cannot be defined by it. For example, let's say you want to hire underwater basket weavers for your awesome underwater basket seasonal business that only operates between the months of April and October in South Florida. You're probably not going to be able to find that category uh, by just looking at the standard occupational code, you're going to have to relate it to something in that code. Perhaps some sort of industrial weaver, some sort of weaver tech, but chances are you may not have actually a category to put it in, which means it's probably not a good position for the H2B visa program. Uh, but let's, let's give a more realistic example, okay? Um, so let's say that you are uh, in the welding category, okay? So you employ welders, you employ pipe fitters, you employ uh, structural metal fabricators. There's a category called welders, solders, and brazers in the standard occupational code. That's probably gonna be good for all of your welders. It might even be good for some of your structural fabricators, but it might not be a good uh, fit for pipe fitters which have their own SOC. And if you try to fit a pipe fitter into that welder, brazer, solder category, you're gonna have a tough time when it comes to get approval. Okay, so you have to be really precise with what you're picking out. Similarly, if you are uh, looking for a nanny, okay, uh, you have to be really careful that you're defining the position as a nanny position within the standard occupational code. So here's a typical kind of inquiry that I get because we do a lot of nannies here. Um, hey, I want my nanny to speak Chinese. I want her to speak Portuguese. 
I want her to speak Hebrew. I want her to speak Tagalog. I want her to be able to drive. I want her to be able to teach my kids math. I want her to be able to cook kosher. I want her to be able to cook halal if necessary. I want her to be able to cook gluten free. And I want her to like pick up my house and wash my dishes. And I want her to be able to garden. If you try to put that on a job description, you're going to be covering five or six different standard occupations. And even if they approve it, it's going to come back at like $700 per hour because that's a Nobel Prize winning person that you just described. You have to describe somebody who is a typical nanny and that's who you're going to be going out to recruit. I don't care if your ideal candidate has all those things. You shouldn't be putting it on there. OK, so the area of intended employment and the occupation have to be tailored for the H2B program themselves. Now let's look at a special, let's look at a special category. What if you're one of these businesses that has a multiple locations? So you have multiple areas of intended employment and you have multiple occupations that you want to hire. Well, then you're really looking at multiple prevailing wages, but you have to be careful. You have to be really clear which locations are within the same area of intended employment. And sometimes if you're, let's say, working a business that has uh, shops along a turnpike, which are within multiple MSAs or multiple counties, you might find that they're all that they're categorized at the end of the day by the Department of Labor as being within the same area of intended employment because of the fact that they're all in the same turnpike and your workers can get to multiple, you know, uh, uh, sites rather easily. In that case, you have to be strategic and actually file multiple prevailing wages to count to cover all the ways that the Department of Labor could interpret right your application. If you have multiple occupations, then for each occupation, you have to file a different prevailing wage. You just have to. There's no way around it. OK, so again, this can be as simple or as complex. What it all means is that this is a really key strategic decision and you should give it time. Processing loan on the prevailing wages has been trending up. It's taking about 35 to 42 days right now. And there's been uh, an increase uh, anecdotally from what I can tell from my filings. I file about 150 of these a year uh, of requests for information. Now, requests for information can slow down what's already a pretty slow application. So you want to give yourself at least 45 days before your filing date to put the prevailing wage in. Because, again, you have to be certified, not just filed, to go to your uh, ETA 9142, a.k.a. the Statement of Need stage. Keep in mind, if you have prior certifications for an occupation that's over 18 months, you had to file a prevailing wage for your extension. And even then, you have to do it well in advance of when you plan on filing that extension. So in short, the prevailing wage is very important. You need to be aware of the area of uh, 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 intended work. You have to be aware of the occupation. And you have to be aware of the timeline. Now, if you understand that, if you feel comfortable with that, then you should go on to the next video, which is where I'll talk about the statement of need and how the prevailing wage interacts with the statement of need at a more holistic level. Cheers.